said so much, so maybe you did talk about this and I missed it, but how could you talk about how uh, this can change, this trend? Yeah. The question, the question is how this can, is there any hope of, of changing this? Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that is a very difficult question. Uh, and it relies upon uh, American citizens acting in political forums, legislatures, uh, providing sufficient funding to, uh, to support uh, the legal justice system, and especially the somewhat more expensive, uh, the somewhat more ex expensive proceedings that involve a higher level of, of trials. So that it would have to be convinced, uh, the American people would have to be convinced that it is a, a price worth paying, that it's, it's worth having a higher level of justice in those, in those uh, forums. You would have to convince, you'd have to um, uh, uh, occasion the kind of self-consciousness that lawyers and judges, or make, make, make real the sort of uh, conviction that lawyers and judges actually have as to the importance of the trial, and uh, convince them that this is a slide that needs to be stopped. Uh, it can be stopped by uh, some decisions of appellate courts on some of these doctrinal matters. If the Supreme Court were to change, uh, their, some of the doctrines that are squeezing the trial out of our legal system would, uh, would, could, be, could, be, could be changed. So it's, it's ultimately, although the jury trial is of constitutional dimension in the United States, so in a sense uh, something that legislatures can't change, all of the wherewithal to make it really living has to be supported by legislatures, appellate courts, lawyers, and, and judges. So you need a rebirth of, of, of um, uh, commitment to the importance of the institution in American life. And that requires, I mean, if you read, if you read the Federalist Papers, it, you can, one can despair. You know, it's a high level of political discourse. They, they were published originally in newspapers. So this is what Americans were reading and considering, the level of political discourse. It, to, today, it's difficult to have a, a, a political discussion about institutions and how important institutions are um, for preserving these essential uh, values. But that's what has to happen. Uh, and um, you know, uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, sayings is that in these matters, uh, uh, pessimists are cowards and optimists are fools. Uh, <laughs> that you to say, well, it's hopeless, is is a cowardly thing. You've got to you've got to make the effort to to try to preserve this important institution. But to expect in our political culture, with the power of market institutions and and the, the style of discourse that occurs in most me mass media, that that is likely to be successful, I think, is, is foolish. So I'm afraid I can't give you, uh, I can't answer in any way other than that. Ma'am. Um, taking the telescopic view, um, it strikes me that this is, this is indicative of a much larger uh, diminishment in our whole culture, which is people's willingness to think engage in meaningful dialogue as meaning making that resolves conflicts. And in uh, Bella's, I don't know if you remember Robert Bella and Habits of the Heart, which I always thought was wonderful. It's, they said the, the birth of this country had two very different poles. One was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which leads to individuality and hopefully not ultimate narcissism. But the other was communitas, the town meeting the ability to come together, which is I think what you're saying is, it, is that, that the trial represents, and be part of an intelligent democracy where you eventually have to stand up, you know, and have agency and take a stand. Right. So where, you know, I think our whole, it's, it's a much yeah. larger piece. Yeah, I, I can't uh, repeat the eloquent question that was just uh, asked or statement that was made, but it's basically, th there, th this seems to be part of a much larger story and it is a story that involves the resolution of the sort of atomistic individual aspect of our culture and what was at least a more communitarian uh, uh, portion of the culture. And the suggestion is that we have moved too dramatically towards an atomistic individualist kind of uh, culture. 
Yeah, and, and you have the same, same uh, my same nervousness about thinking in those broad terms because you can say these are sociological forces that are so vast that there's no way of um, no no way of, um, uh, of 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 taking action against them. And I I I, I think we can't believe that. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. We can't believe it. We we have to. Uh, operate under the assumption that political action in all of those forums can reconstitute our uh, our political culture, whether it's true or not. Well, and uh, also you can be Candide and make your garden grow wherever you are. Well, that's that's the alternative. Uh, should you, we're neither good nor wise, so let's just uh, cultivate our own individual worlds. And that's, of course, the great temptation. That's the stoic way forward in the Roman Empire. The, the big empire is hopeless, so let's just try to cultivate our own souls and, and the individual world. Our culture has rejected that broadly. Our, the democratic element in our culture has. That path leads to all kinds of awfulness over, over generations. I mean, Hannah Arendt's story about the re one of the reasons why Europe fell so easily into totalitarianism is that there were not developed political culture, political cultures and practices that existed. In fact, they had no. Um, Austria-Hungary eliminated the jury in the late 19th century, and Germany eliminated the jury in the 20s. Uh, so there were no jury trials. All of the judges in, in Germany in the 20s and 30s were typically old authoritarian holdovers from the Kaiser's world. And they, it offered no resistance at all, of course, to the, what occurred thereafter. So if, if the jury trial is revitalized, it, it does, it can operate as some kind of a, an anchor against the worst kinds of outcomes that we can face. Sir? Um, would you comment, please, about the, um, in the criminal context, the importance of the defense bar, and even more specifically, uh, the role the public defenders can play in this? Yeah, the, 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 the comment is, is asked me to talk about the role of the defense bar in the criminal context and particularly uh, the role of the public defenders. Uh, there, there are a good number of public defenders offices that are excellent around the country. They do great work, very dedicated people, although even in those offices they're overworked. Um, sometimes to the point of where, where they're uh, asked to do more than they should be allowed to do. Uh, but and in many parts of the country, th that th there is not even a organized public defenders kind of system like we have here in, in Cook County. Uh, that defense is done by appointments to underpaid lawyers who have no interest in criminal law at all, uh, but take the appointments because otherwise they'd have nothing else, else to do. So in some ways, our overworked big city public defender's office is, are the best kinds of uh, offices that we have around the United States. Um, and this is another example. It's, it's such a hard sell politically. I mean, the story over the last 50 years is the, the, um, involves an increase in the number of criminal cases, an increase of the funding in prosecutor's offices, and a decrease in the amount of funding that, that goes to the public defender's offices around the, uh, the country. And that's part of the squeezing of democratic institutions, the jury trial, by market, uh, by market forces. Um, and, and it has resulted in uh, the mechanization of this assembly line form of resolution of criminal cases. It's another pressure. We have great formal institutions the, in the fifth, sixth, and seventh amendments of the Constitution. But what we can, what, what can happen is they can be squeezed by underfunding and by bureaucratic pressure. And that's, that's what we have in, the, in our criminal justice system. And the unwillingness to fund public defender's offices are in, an important part of that. Politicians, I mean, this is why uh, optimists are fools. Politicians have to be able to stand up and say, uh, people accused of crime have a right to a, a defense that is competent and where the lawyer has enough time and resources to actually present a uh, defense in order to prevent the rash of false convictions that, um, that here in Cook County, but throughout the country, uh, uh, we've, we've experienced, even in the most important cases, even in capital cases. Sir, ma'am. Uh, 
there are a lot of cases out there, civil and criminal, and the judges are under pressure to move the cases, to dispose them. So judges, uh, you know, to encourage them to have more trials, they need to be encouraged. And probably we need more judges. Uh, so that, well, that's true too, but it's part of the same, part of this, uh, the, the, the comment was that judges are under pressure to move their cases, to dispose of their cases, and probably we need more judges as well as more public defenders, and that's true too. It's part of the same story, the need to provide more resources to these important public uh, institutions. Uh, um, every, everyone uh, can become self-interested. Uh, maybe it's inevitable. I mean, prosecutors want a higher conviction rate, so they want fewer trials where they could actually lose, and they want more pleas where they can't lose, uh, so they can run on a very high conviction rate. Judges, who are sometimes evaluated by their disposition rate, uh, have an interest in looking good by those bureaucratic uh, measures. In, in fact, uh, moving cases in a rigorous way, deliberate way, to trial it's not so clear, and there are some studies that suggest this, that that really takes more time. If you, if you allow more time for discovery in civil cases, civil rights cases, and allow the case to just go on forever, uh, more resources get poured into those. The, trial, the, the case stays pending for a longer period of time, and you may un end up costing more and taking more judicial resources than a, a crisp, well-tried case earlier in this process with a sensible amount of discovery. Any judge has a lot of control over any case, though. So if the judge wants something to go to trial or doesn't want it to go to trial, that's a key. It, it is it is part of the culture of judging that I mentioned, that if you think you're a manager rather than uh, someone who's, whose primary task is to preside over and preserve this important traditional democratic institution, you, you can slide into that bureaucratic style of thinking. And my job is to have a higher disposition rate, which means pressure more early settlements and uh, allow for continuances for the discovery that will result in settlements because people will be worn down. Um, those bureaucratic pressures are on prosecutors and on, on judges. Um, and uh, that, it, take, it takes a lot of gumption to cut against them. I think it can be kind of, it can't, they can be resisted by people with the kind of uh, understanding and, of and commitment to the values that this institution involves. And so once again, I'm, I'm preaching. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are also tremendous pressures brought by insurance carriers in businesses where they look at a matter and they say, we don't care if you're right or wrong, we want to cut our exposure and settle it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it will always be true. I, I, the, the, the notion is, the, the comment was, there's pressure by insurance carriers uh, to get rid of cases early uh, because they do a pure cost-benefit analysis and let's get it done with. Um, it will always be true, and it's not a bad thing, that most cases settle, but that 98% of cases settle or are resolved on summary matters, that, that's not a good thing. Um, so that, that there is a significant level of settlement is not really offensive, I think, to important values, but that there really is no choice in the matter by virtue of the pressures of the system um, does, I think, offend these, these central, central values that we have. Sir? As a retired reporter, author, uh, intense fan of Having just seen Aaron Brockovich, I really think you have a solution to the problem, and it's the last point that you made. What, what we as journalists cannot do is make things as dramatic as we want to. <laughs> so the, 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 the lawyers can, and they want to make it as, as, as and they never, they've got their freedom. And I think that your next book should be what we learned from, from, from trials in this country. In other words, to pick out those things and then present them in a dramatic way and talk about the very issues that you, you gave excellent examples. But, you know, certainly about some of the laws and counts about fracking, what's coming up in those cases. You know, that's, in a sense, that's what I would like to see your, your speech start off with because we had to grab hold of this subject 
of, you know, most of us didn't recognize what you were talking about when you said the trials are going away. And then as you did, we did, yeah, oh yeah, I got that, and yes. But that's the drama that you can give behind it that we as journalists couldn't always do it, or even as authors couldn't always do it, and we need. Okay. The, 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 co the comment is from a retired journalist who uh, uh, urges that lawyers um, exploit the inherently dramatic nature of the trial and perhaps their ability to present these issues in, in, in dramatic ways such that uh, uh, citizens appreciate the importance of, of this issue. And um, I think that's right. And, and he also gives me an assignment for my next book uh, <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to write a book that describes w what it is that we as a people or a citizenry have learned from our trials uh, and to present that in a kind of dramatic way. It seems I need to write a screenplay, perhaps, rather than a book, uh, because uh, movies probably have more uh, impact than books do, and I'll have to start thinking about screenplays rather than university press books, I think, if I'm going to have the effect that you're, de that you're describing. But, ma'am. My brother. Oh, sorry. He's your brother? He writes, yeah. he writes screenplays, too. Ah. <laughs> But I, I want to ask a question. How many people here have served on a jury? How many people, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, have been called to jury duty but not served? <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. The, we are the people who should be there. Yeah. The, the comment is uh, that many people who are called to jury duty don't serve. And I think that's a real problem. I, I think that um, fewer people should be excused from uh, jury service. If you show up and you're willing to serve, you should serve. Absent some, um, absent <coughs> some uh, serious reason why you can't serve on a particular uh, case. My, my, my brothers uh, in the trial world of, of uh, the trial bar uh, are jealous to preserve their peremptory challenges uh, because they think that uh, you can't rely on a judge to make fair judgments about who should be excused and not. So you need, you need absolute discretion in that in that regard. But I think I think it is um, it's a, it, it, it is an injustice that people who, who show up and are willing to serve uh, don't. And, and I think there should be fewer reasons why individuals who are willing to be jurors don't serve uh, as jurors. I think it's an important part of, of um, our, our important responsibility and privilege uh, uh, of, of citizenship, and we should all do it more. Are you related to the well, last two uh, speakers? <laughs> no. You have to speak up a little. Sorry, okay, we'll, we'll stand. Um, what do you think the effect of this kind of thing has the deterioration of uh, trial, I guess jury trials, and the basic lack of humanity, lack of human emotion that kind of brings? Yeah. Do you think this has an effect on, I guess, increased sentencing, mandatory minimums, and those kind of things? Yeah, the, the question, as I understand it, is asked me to comment on the the uh, it, the 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 lack of uh, the, the the decreasing number of trials and the, with the sort of humanity that's brought to bear in a in the decision of a trial and the increasing of increases in mandatory minimum and the the um, uh, expansion of the number of convictions that take place and the length of, of services so uh, the the new Jim Crow phenomenon for example and the fact that uh, the United States astoundingly uh, Im imprisons a million people and keeps another uh, significant number under some some form of probation, way out of relationship to that of the of the rest of the uh, the rest of the, the Western world. Um, well, what, one of the one of the results of this is that decisions, individual decisions, and in individual cases are made, as one person put it, sort of from fifty thousand feet. Uh, we have mechanical sets of sentencing guidelines. They are imposed uh, 
there's been some relief from this recently, but they're imposed in a kind of mechanical way by judges who can't exercise discretion in individual cases. So individualized justice can't really be done. I think it's wrong that jurors in criminal cases are unaware of the sentences that are that result from the convictions that they're asked to provide. I think uh, unlike in civil cases where they award the amount of damages or results in those cases, in the criminal context, um, the, the sentences to be imposed, which are mandatory minimums uh, in, in many cases, uh, are imposed uh, after a conviction when the jury is completely unaware of the consequences of a conviction. And sometimes they are shocked when they learn of what the actual uh, period of incarceration that will follow a conviction on which, uh, which they have provided, which they've, which they've decided to impose is. So I think that's wrong. It, it prevents the kind of individualized justice, humane justice if you want, that uh, responsible jurors are in a position are, and are completely competent to engage in. Part of the bureaucratization of the system and the, and the mass political nature of our criminal justice system uh, really since the late 70s and the, the way in which it's become a public issue in a kind of um, a mass media way that, that distorts really what's, what's, what's at issue, I think. Thank you. and importance of this issue is reflected in the number of questions that people have had and that we're not even going to get to all of them. I think that Bob's available to stay a little bit longer if people want to come up and discuss this issue further with him. I want to thank all of you for being here and also coming from the bridge. I sort of want to remind you why we do this trek in a way, which is that Darrow, before he died, um, made a bet with a friend, a magician, and said, because Darrow did not believe in life after death, if there is such a thing as life after death, I will appear at this bridge. Um, and it was because it was a bridge he used to live at 59th and I think Stony Island. Midway um, Pleasant. And he used to take walks across that bridge, across the lagoon, and his ashes were strewn into the lagoon when he died. And so that's why we go to the bridge to commemorate him. We come indoors because it's usually cold outside on March 13th. Um, so thank you for doing that. Next year, we will try to be ahead of the changes going on at the museum, both in terms of parking, snow, construction, and get you a heads up on some of that. We did the best we could this year. Um, two other things, if you are not on our mailing list, please sign up. There's a um, sheet by the table with Leslie Nielsen's materials. And I neglected to say, and really want to, that Nina Barrett, um, who was very much involved in putting together this wonderful video that, that you sort of got to see. Um, it has a book forthcoming on the Leopold and Loeb trial. And so keep your eye out for that as well, as well as Bob Burns' book on the Kafka trial. So thank you so much, Bob. We really appreciate it. Thank you all of you. Hi, I'm Rachel from the museum. Just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you next year. Please feel free to pack up your bags and things. I wish I had take-home containers for all the donuts, friends, family, and colleagues. And we'll do our best to keep you um, updated on the